Uh, can I just say I love that I'm a part of a body that does not treat prayer for the sick like uh, a pity answer. I'm going to harp on that for a little bit because don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to this, but um, there's a lot of discipleship moments that happen in a church service that we can sometimes miss if we don't take a minute to just slow down and see what happened. Um, do you realize that you, when you cooperate with the Holy Spirit, have, in a certain degree, co-creative authority with Jesus? Yes. Some of you, that just went way over your head, and that's good, because some of you haven't had anything go over your head, you feel like, in a church in a long time, so we're going to challenge some stuff today. Um, the, the Word says that we've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. Yes, this is Ephesians 1. And then if you look, even in John 1, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, we get a a glimpse into how creation happened. And it says, "In in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we're getting this picture of, you know, in the beginning, so we're using Genesis language, it's intentionally calling people back to what they've read in Genesis chapter 1. And it's saying that in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and it's speaking of Jesus. So... Combining all of these perspectives, we're getting this picture of as the Father is speaking, Jesus, the Son of God, is the active agent in creation. He's speaking, and as God's speaking, Jesus is bringing light into being. He's bringing creation forth. Now, in Jesus, post-cross, you as a believer are seated next to that man in heavenly places. That's not an opinion, that's scriptural fact. So I like to believe that if that's true, I think it's right to believe that when God says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons and cleanse lepers, freely you've received, freely give, that that then is something that's actually attainable in the Christian life, not something that we aspire to someday happening somewhat infrequently as we live and follow Jesus. You ready today? <laughs> I, I like to share something. Sometimes when I'm speaking, I like to share things that are fresh, just as the Lord's been talking to me even recently. And also, I, there's a testimony that I just have to share that I heard recently. You guys all, well, many of you know Joanne Moody, yeah? Um, she's a friend of this house. She's been a spiritual mother to me. Um, she's obviously got connections all over the place. Um, it's very common in the United States to hear testimonies of really miraculous things happening and your gut is to go, so that happened on the mission field somewhere, right? Because that doesn't, stuff doesn't happen in the U.S. So we we recently received a report uh, that on the streets of, I want to believe, I want to say Nashville, Tennessee, it was a city in Tennessee, uh, there was a group of YWAMers who were going out every Friday night like they do to preach the gospel. They encounter a woman on the street who's been medically verified as dead for 10 minutes. EMS was already on the scene. She had been pronounced dead. It had been 10 minutes. They go and they say, hey, can we pray for this woman that she would come back? And the EMS people go, well, I mean, do what you want. She's gone. So they pray. They pray for a solid 10 minutes. And then this woman's eyes snap open and she sits up and she's completely back. Again, she had been medically verified as dead. So this isn't, you know, a homeless person was taking a nap on the side of the road. Uh, This wasn't a drug-induced thing. She was gone. And now she's not. We need to keep these sorts of stories in front of us uh, because it's very easy to feed ourselves with uh, the problems that are happening instead of the, the person who's seated on the throne who is the solution to those problems. It's very easy to rehearse what's not going right instead of looking to the one who's going to make everything right. That's where we need to live. That's where we need to come from. Weigh in. I've got like five other things I can talk about, but I'm weighing where I need to go. I'll get there. Holy Spirit, help me. I need it. Amen. (laughs) 
I've lost a lot of my religiosity over the years, and it's a good thing, so I don't have to pray for 10 minutes to feel like God's going to show up. (laughs) All right, so we're going to be wrapping up the story of Gideon. We got mainly just through chapter 6 last week. Um, It was pretty dense. There's a lot going on in chapter 6. We're going to be going a little bit more briefly through chapter 7 and 8. There's a lot of Uh, words in this part of the narrative, but in terms of meat and things that we're actually going to parse out, uh, relatively less. So again, we're going to be able to get through these two chapters uh, in the next however long I have. Um, And we're going to, I want to start in chapter seven, and we're going to go verses one through eight. We're just going to jump right in. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 7, Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the troops who were with him got up early and camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them, uh, below the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many troops for me to hand the Midianites over to them, or else Israel might elevate themselves over me and say, I saved myself. Now announce to the troops, whoever is fearful and trembling may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 72,000, 72,000 of the troops turned back, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many troops. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. If I say to you, this one can go with you, he can go. But if I say about anyone, this one cannot go with you, he cannot go. And then to essentially shortcut the rest of that, many of us know the story. Uh, Gideon gets left with 300 out of the original, about like 80, 82,000 that he had show up with him originally. Now, What I want to highlight about this portion of the text and this portion of the story, um, we have this thing in Christianity where we, anything that doesn't make sense, uh, we instantly turn to wanting to kind of over-spiritualize. So I've heard all kinds of explanations around what was going on when God said, okay, you know, anybody who's afraid can go home. That one kind of makes sense. But then people start to break down, well, you know, the reason that God wanted the people who, you know, lapped the water a certain way is it showed that they're like ready to fight versus not. And I just want to tell you that from the research that I've done, that doesn't actually matter. Um, what God's getting at, and again, this is the whole point, one of the main points, I should say, of Gideon's story and even of Judges as a whole, he's, God said at the very beginning, I'm going to make sure that you have an inordinately small group of people because I need to make sure that you know, not just the people who you're coming up against, I need to make sure that you know there's no way you could have figured this out on your own. I need to make sure that you know that this was me and not you. And as we break down and kind of get more into the the headspace of what's going on here, and even as we look through, again, Gideon's story and Judges, we we use this phrase, again, in Christianity where we say, you know, God gets all the glory. And that's true. But what I want to focus on here for just a second is a lot of times we say that, and what's running in the background of our heads is God's the sort of big-headed megalomaniac who just needs to like he needs you he needs to make sure that you know that like okay yeah you helped but I need you to make sure that like I get the praise I get the attention like he has this ego that needs to be stroked and I want to propose to you that that's number one not true about who our father is and number two I want to propose to you that he does that not for his sake but for ours as we'll see in Gideon's story and as we see throughout scripture, the moment a human being starts getting the glory that should only be going to God, things go downhill so fast. It's not just that God deserves it, though that's true. It's that God deserves it and we don't know how to handle that. A really quick story in the New Testament that pops up is and I'm just going to share it briefly because it's a good example, Herod, the the same Herod who had all the babies executed right when Jesus was born, bad guy. There's a story in scripture where he is enacting taxes on sort of a neighboring civilization, and they come to him, and they're trying to cozy up to him, 
So he gives this big speech, and they say, not, not the voice of a man, the voice of a god. And then because Herod didn't correct them, he took that in. It says that there was an angel that struck him dead where he stood. The reason we need to make sure God gets glory and we glorify him for the things that he's done, again, is not because he has an ego that needs to be stroked. It's not because he's got this fragile sense of identity that he needs all this attention. It's because he knows we can't handle that. And because he knows we can't handle that, it proves that he's actually interested in our longevity in doing what he's asked us to do. Because if we can't handle it and we go the way of Gideon, as we'll see here in a few minutes, things go downhill really fast. We end up disqualifying ourselves. God's actually about you finishing and finishing the race well. God's about you going from glory to glory. And that looks like going from glory to glory through the rest of your life. God's not the type of person who, hey, I'm going to give you a call. I'm going to give you a mission. As soon as you do it, I'm done with you. It's, I'm going to establish you, and I'm going to move you from glory to glory, from the next thing to the next thing. Can I tell you that this looks like people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s on fire for Jesus? We've adopted sort of an American retirement mentality around following the Lord. As soon as I hit 50 or as soon as I'm, you know, a certain age, I can sort of let the, let the younger people do the radical stuff. I can let the younger people follow Jesus in a way that, you know, for them that's cool. For me, I put my, really, this phrase gets to the heart behind it. I've put my dues in. I don't need to do that anymore. Can I tell you from somebody who's a part of a younger generation, I need people who have more experience than me I need people who have followed Jesus for longer than me. I need people who have hit rock bottom a few times and still seen the faithfulness of God to come alongside me to help me go where I'm supposed to go. God's about longevity. He wants that for you. He wants that for us. So again, we can kind of summarize that whole, chap- that whole portion of the chapter of the 300 down. If you need a main takeaway point, God just needed Israel to make sure that they knew God's the one who got you here. It wasn't yourself. Your effort didn't get you here. Then if we go into verse nine, verses 9 through 14, that night the Lord said to him, get up and attack the camp for I have handed it over to you. But if you are afraid to attack the camp, go down with Pura, your servant, listen to what they say. And then you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So we went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the troops who were in the camp. Now the Midianites, Amalekites, and all the people of the east had settled down in the valley like a swarm of locusts, and their camels were as innumerable as the sand on the seashore. When Gideon arrived, there was a man telling his friend about a dream. He said, listen, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp, struck a tent, and it fell. The loaf turned the tent upside down so that it collapsed. His friend answered, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has handed the entire Midianite camp over to him. A few things to note here. Uh, Number one, something that I love to point out, God still loves to speak through dreams. And again, if scripture is our blueprint, one of the most common ways that God speaks throughout scripture is dreams. And the reader, again, this was written for a primarily Jewish audience. So the reader, as they're going through this narrative, they're seeing this Midianite say, behold, I had a dream, which is the exact same phrase that Joseph uses in his story. Behold, I had a dream. And then he starts talking to his family. So we're getting this sort of literary picture of like, okay, so this isn't just some random pizza dream. This is God's about to say something. And then we get through the dream, we get an interpretation, and we see God, again, is faithful to what he told Gideon. He said, look, if you're afraid, because again, if we remember from last week, 
So much of what this chapter is about is Gideon is not sure if he can really trust God. He's not sure, again, like God's proved himself with all of these tests. And what I even love about this that displays so much of the nature and character of the God that we serve is he pretty much knows if he were to just tell Gideon to go, he'd get another objection. So he just shortcuts it. <laughs> he says, hey, go do this. And, 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 like, it's like you can see Gideon starting to take a breath to be like, but what about... And he cuts him off and he says, if you're still afraid, go down there, check it out, you'll be encouraged. God's faithful to do what he said he was going to do, even in the small things, even in the little details. And even as we're going through the narrative, we're starting to get this idea that maybe Gideon is beginning to believe God. Because you have to remember the circumstances for which he had to get his encouragement was he had to sneak into an enemy camp. And the, the author made it very clear about how many people were there. Uh, camels that outnumbered the sands on the seashore, like a swarm of locusts. He's using plague imagery, which again would have been really familiar to the Israelite audience. They're thinking the 10 plagues that destroyed Egypt's crops that totally decimated them. So they're getting this really intense picture and that's the context that Gideon is taking his servant and sneaking into. So, you know, that, that valiant warrior word that Gideon got at the very beginning of his story, we're starting to see him think, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is real. He sneaks down there. He gets the encouragement. He comes back. And then we pick up again with verse 15. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to Israel's camp and said, get up for the Lord has handed the Midianite camp over to you. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies and gave each of the men a trumpet in one hand and an empty pitcher with a torch inside it in the other hand. Watch me, he said to them, and do what I do. When I come to the outpost of the camp, do as I do. When I and everyone with me blow our ram's horns, you are also to blow your ram's horns all around the camp. Then you will say, for the Lord and for Gideon. Put a pin in that one. Take note of that phrase. Gideon and the hundred who were hundred men who were with him went to the outpost of the camp, beginning of the middle of the watch, after the sentries had been stationed. They blew their horns, broke the pitchers that were in their hands. The three companies blew their ram's horns and shattered their pitchers. They held their torches in their left hands and their ram's horns uh, to blow in their right hands, and they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each Israelite took his position around the camp, and the entire Midianite army began to run, and they cried out as they fled. When Gideon's men blew their 300 ram's horns, the Lord caused the men and the whole army to turn on each other with their swords. They fled to Acacia House in the direction of Zerera. Didn't practice that word before I got up here. As far as the border of Abimelech. Didn't practice that word either. (laughs) Then the men of Israel were called from Naphtali, Asher, Manasseh, and they pursued the Midianites. If you're again, familiar with this passage, you kind of miss the ridiculousness of what's happening. We're talking about this gigantic army, tens and tens of thousands of people, and you've got 300 people. We don't have that many people in here, but if you figure if this sanctuary was full, every person in a seat, we're talking about that many people coming up against tens and tens of thousands of trained warriors, and their strategy is, I'm going to blow my horn, Smash a vase, hold up a torch. <laughs> Go get him. <'em>. Yep. <laughs> exactly. So, again, these stories that we get really familiar with, it's helpful when you're trying to get the full picture to slow down just a second and think about what's actually going on. And then keeping in line with God's, you know, declaration of, I need you to know that I'm the one who delivered you. It says that God caused the Midianites to start attacking each other as that happened. So this trained military force, who, by the way, has been oppressing these people for decades at this point, who are pretty familiar with the area, the stuff that goes on there, these guys crack a vase, hold up, a, lamp, hold up a, a torch, shout something, and now all of a sudden there's bedlam in the camp and they start attacking each other. That's miraculous. Yes. 
That's the power of God at work. And again, it's God proving himself faithful to a people who are still questioning his character and his motives. The goodness of God is that his faithfulness to you is not predicated on you. The beauty and the majesty and the glory of who Jesus is to us is that his sacrifice for us, who he is for us, is not dependent on you getting it right and it's not dependent on you having everything nailed down about his character. If it were, we'd be in trouble. I'm going to harp on this for just another second because this is something that somebody shared with me and it's very much set me free in a lot of different areas of my life. We, we love God. We pursue him. And even though his faithfulness towards us isn't predicated on us getting everything right, you know, as we're growing, we're still stretching out towards that, right? You know, his, his grace is not an excuse for us to be sloppy, if I can put it in that way. Like we're, we're trying to grow, we're trying to become more and more like the God that we love and that we serve, yeah? But in that process, we, try, we can fall into this ditch of perfectionism where we get so in our heads about, I need to have this nailed down, and what about this, and what about that? And all of a sudden, something that was birthed from a place of fascination with who God is now becomes a curse where we're so inside of our heads that we're, we're trying to get everything right that we've now all of a sudden found ourselves in a place where we're no longer actually talking to God about what he's like. We're trying to, you know, cross our T's and dot our I's. And the next thing we know, we're trying to be right about him without actually knowing him. But this, this thing set me free. Nobody in this room, nobody that's existed, is going to see Jesus face to face when they die and say, I got all that right. <laughs> nobody. Not Paul, not Timothy, not Peter. Nobody throughout all of history, when we die and we see him face to face or he comes back, whichever one happens first, none of us are going to see him in the fullness of who he is and be like, yeah, I just nailed that. <laughs> I got it so correct. I could not have gotten it any more correct. <laughs> Let that set you free. Because God, again, he's more committed to you than you know how to be committed to him. <laughs> One more thing that happened for me personally that's sort of on the same lines. I've mentioned before my degrees in Bible and theology. I needed to adjust my glasses as I said that because, you know, it makes me... <laughs> <laughs> Very early on when I was studying and I was walking in between classes, the Lord just spoke very clearly. There, there are times where you hear him and it's sort of that still small voice and there's other times where you hear him and it's sort of like internal audible is the way I've heard it described. I know I'm not hearing something, but it's like the voice of God just kind of breaks through everything that's going on for you internally and it just sort of reverberates. And the, the gist of what he said was, Aaron, if you study so that you can be right, that's all you'll get. If you study so that you can know me, then you'll know me. So let that be what pushes you. Let that be what drives you towards knowing him. You're not going to get everything right. You can't. That's why he put you in a body. You realize that he put you in a body because it's not possible for you to get everything right. It's not possible for you to meet all of your own needs. Oh, I stepped on somebody's uh, sacred cow there. I felt that. It is... Again, you're like, how did you get here from Gideon? I don't know, but here we are. The... There's this thing 
in American Christianity where our fallback is uh, if stuff doesn't work out at church, then I can just do me and Jesus. And can I tell you there are seasons where the Lord will call us into periods of isolation. I'm not saying that there aren't exceptions, but what the scripture tells us is this only happens the way that it was intended to happen in a body of other believers. (laughs) Selah. This is what happens when you take rabbit trails. You've got to find yourself back in your notes. <laughs> so this man has a dream. Gideon says, oh my gosh, God, he's, he's really going to back me up. He's really going to follow me on this. So then he goes back to his people. He says, yeah, let's do it. They break the, break the stuff. Camp starts going crazy. I, I want to point out something. Again, I told us to put a pin in this that we're going to start to see be the unraveling of Gideon, though. God made it very clear to Gideon and to everybody else, nobody else gets the glory for this except for me. Like, you need to know you're not the one who put this together. So then we see this phrase, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon just kind of tacks his name on to the end of what God told him to do, almost like he had something to do with it. And we're going to get into this again later in chapter 8, but this sort of usage of the name of God is actually, and it's not this instance, but I'm sort of getting us a concept here. This thing that we do of sort of slapping God's name onto the end of something or even tacking our name onto the end of something that was God's idea is actually much closer to what the the scriptural idea of taking God's name in vain is rather than just, you know, our common cultural understanding, OMG. Christians, I've, again... Part of my upbringing was I was sort of around a very legalistic um, branch of the Christian family tree. The moment somebody said, OMG, you got like, you know, you got the hammer brought down on you. They weren't Catholic, but they probably had rulers in their, in their back pocket anyway, and they were ready to just. <laughs> but something that we do, are prone to do as humans, we so want validation from other people uh, in church contexts or just in life that we will, out of our own insecurity, throw God's name on the end of our idea to give it validity. I'm going to let that one hang and then we're going to get back to it. And again, the sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And from here we see the decline. And you'll also notice, I'll just make this note as you go through the rest of the chapter, from this point forward, God's voice is obviously absent from the rest of his story. As we go through, you'll notice that. In uh, chapter 7, verse 24, Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim with this message, come down to intercept the Midianites and take control of the water courses ahead of them as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they took control of the water courses as far as Beth Barah and Jordan. They captured Oreb and Zeb, the two princes of Midian. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the wine press of Zeb while they were pursuing the Midianites. They brought the heads of those two generals to Gideon across the Jordan. And to backtrack just a little bit, there is in the up for verse 23, the men of Israel were called from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, and they pursued the Midianites. Why is this an issue? Because God made it super clear, you get 300 people to do this, and that's it. But as soon as Gideon's perception of what the desired effect is happens, he then jumps in with his own good ideas about what needs to happen to sort of finalize this victory. Following the will of God needs to look like 
performing God's word, but doing it in God's way. It looks like performing God's word, but doing it God's way. We are very results oriented in our culture, just here in America. So our thought is like, hey, if God said this is the desired outcome that I want, and this is how I want you to do it, but we think we have really good ideas about how we're supposed to get there, we're very comfortable just slipping our strategies, our methods, all of that stuff in there. Um, and this is not, what I'm about to say is not a wholesale condemnation of like church growth strategies or anything like that. Because the, the flip side to this is if God gives you something to do, he also expects you to steward it and to grow it. So don't hear me um, incorrectly. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not somebody who would say, you know, the only way to have effective growth or effectively steward something is you pray in tongues for 30 minutes and then just throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but... I would question sometimes if the way that we approach church growth in America, if the way that we approach evangelism, the way that we think about ministry in general is just about how can I insert strategies to just make this get as big as it can. Again, revealing our ideas that big is equal to success. We throw that stuff in there and we're very comfortable with it. All the while we've conveniently forgotten to ask God, how do you want me to do this thing that you've told me to do? And if you think that God doesn't care about the how, let me invite you to read some very lengthy portions of scripture in Exodus where he's telling Israel how they're supposed to build the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle. God very much cares about the how. The invitation here that I'm going to insert is slow down. Take the time to just ask him. A lot of times, I think, I'm not going to get too sidetracked here. I think a lot of times we neglect to ask God because we're assuming that he gives us a word and it needs to happen yesterday. I'm seeing question marks over people's heads. You're like, you mean that's not? <laughs> no. Actually, I'm in a little bit of a Bible nerd, church history nerd, so I'll share this with you. How many of you guys know St. Patrick? How many of you guys know a little bit of his story? Yeah? So St. Patrick, again, won't get too far into this, but it's a cool point and something that I didn't know until a few years ago. A lot of us know the story about how, you know, I, he's an Englishman. He gets captured by Irish pirates along the coast. He gets taken back to Ireland. God supernaturally and miraculously guides him out. He's having dreams and visions the whole way, gets on a boat, finally gets back to England, and then he starts having dreams very similar to Paul's dream of a Macedonian man. He's seeing these Irishmen say, Patrick, we need the gospel. We need the gospel. We need you to come back. And in our, again, partially ignorant and partially westernized versions of the story, we immediately jump to him being in Ireland. What most of us don't know is that there was a 30-year gap between when he had that dream and when he finally got back to Ireland. A 30-year gap of him studying. He was not even a clergyman when he initially got that call, so he became a clergy. Then he became a bishop, so that, again, church structure at the time, so that he could be sent out with the church's blessing and with the church's backing and have people go with him. There was all of that study, all of that preparation in between when he gets the word and when he actually goes, and there was betrayal. One of his closest confidants is confessor, the person who he told everything to. When he went to his first hearing to become a bishop, that guy who he was supposed to trust stood up and said, not this guy, let me tell you 52 reasons why. Most of us would get offended at that point and give up and say, I guess I didn't hear God. God's word performed God's way is what we're after. And this is, again, why we start to see Gideon going downhill. We got through the first chunk of verse 8, or chapter 8, uh, in verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read 
verses 4 through, let me see, 4 through 9 and then 15 through 21 because there's a bunch of narrative in here, but we're going to just hone in on a few things. Gideon and the 300 men came to the Jordan and crossed it. They were still exhausted, but in pursuit. He said to the men of Sukkot, please give me some loaves of bread to the troops under my command because they are exhausted for I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. These were some kings who had gotten away in the course of the battle and Gideon and trying to, again, do things his way was following the pattern of the time and saying, I need to completely decimate these people and I need to take out their leaders. That's when I can know we're done. So he's going after them. Obviously, you know, you got 300 men running around and army marches on its stomach. Uh, they need some food, they need some water. But the princes of Sukkot asked, are Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hands that we should give bread to your army? Gideon replied, very well, when the Lord has handed Zeba and Zalmunna over to me, I will tear your flesh with thorns and briars from the wilderness. He went from there to Penuel and asked the same thing from them. The men of Penuel answered just as the men of Sukkot had answered. He also told the men of Penuel, when I return safely, I will tear down this tower. Jumping forward to verses 15 through 21. Then he went to the men of Sukkot and said, here are Zeba and Zalmunna. You taunted me about them saying, are Zeba and Zalmunna now in your power that we should give bread to your exhausted men? So he took the elders of the city and he took some thorns and briars from the wilderness and he disciplined the men of Sukkot with them. He also tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. Gideon very quickly goes from the person that God has anointed to set Israel free. He goes very much from the judge, the deliverer, and he starts looking more like what we would know as a modern day warlord. Something interesting to note, which makes more sense at this point in the narrative, Gideon's name in Hebrew actually means hacker. And I want to take a second to call all the way back to the beginning of Gideon's narrative, where the angel of the Lord told Gideon, or called him rather, a mighty man of valor. And then Gideon comes in with all these excuses and really shows what he believes about himself. I'm the least of my father's house, the least house in the smallest tribe of Manasseh. And then we follow through through the rest of the narrative and Gideon's you know, testing God at every turn he can, asking him questions, showing, I don't know if I believe you, that you're going to do what you said you're going to do. But at this point, and if we're looking from this end of the narrative through to the front, we also can start to see that it's not just that Gideon didn't believe what God said about himself. Gideon didn't believe what God was saying about Gideon. How do you know? Because that whole episode with Sukkot and Penuel, that is the picture of a man who's angry because his pride has been hurt. That is the picture of a man who has something to prove to people. Why does he have something to prove to people? God's called him a mighty warrior. If you don't take a second to make sure that you believe about yourself what God's actually said about you, you will spend the rest of your life trying to prove it to everybody else and prove it to yourself. Because when you're free from insecurity and you're free from the fear of man, people can throw all kinds of accusations and questions at you and you just don't care. When you get free from the fear of man, when you get free from the fear of what other people think about you, their opinions about you really don't matter. I can even speak from my own life. I've been getting progressively, even in the last couple of years, as my spiritual father, Eric Waterbury, has been helping me, again, talking to an older generation where we need an older generation who loves God's on fire for Jesus to call us out and call us up. I've been getting, the more free I get from the fear of even what, I love all of you, but even as I get more free from the fear of what you think of me when I stand up here, the more I can actually say what God's given me to say. Right. 
And the more free from the fear of man that a person gets, the more that you can actually start to focus on, okay, I can actually start becoming who God's told me that I am. And I don't have to, I can focus on character and I don't have to lean into my giftings to try to prove to everybody that I am who God said I am. How does, Aaron, that's weird, how does that shake out in in the scripture? If Gideon knows that he's a mighty man of valor and actually starts to believe that in his core, he doesn't have to go back and not just punish, but brutally punish anybody who questions him along the way. He knows I'm the person who God set up to do this job. I can just go do the job and be done with it. And whatever they think, they can deal with themselves. But again, because he didn't believe that, he's thinking, how do, what's going on to some degree? And again, this is, this is more the lens that I'm reading this passage through. I just want to be clear on that. You're not going to find this in a commentary, but this is the lens that I'm reading this passage through. If Gideon believes about himself what God's already told him, he's not needing to think, okay, what would a mighty man of valor do in this moment? And then he's looking to the culture and saying like, okay, probably kill and or brutally beat these people. He's saying, I'm already the guy, I'm becoming this person, I'm becoming this man who God's called me to be. So I don't need to like force my way or try to think about what would this person do to prove to everybody else around me that I am that thing. I'm getting a little bit nebulous in terms of the language that I'm using here, but this is something that I wanted to say at the beginning of, of the message when I started speaking, but um, we're, we're a part of a culture that believes in values, practices to some degree, the prophetic. Um, the, one of the dangers or I should say pitfalls that comes with being in that sort of a culture, if we don't balance things well, or I should say practice well what scripture talks about in regards to prophecy, uh, then we start chasing the next word from the next person to get us to feel better about where we're at instead of doing something with the last word God gave us. Sometimes, most of the time, we don't need a new word. We need to do something with what God's already spoken. I'm going to hit just a few things because I see I'm about to get the staff here. But (laughs) it's okay, I need that. Otherwise, I could keep talking and I'd keep you guys here way longer than you needed to be. So moving forward, to shortcut the narrative a bit, Gideon gets these kings after he's taken care of all these other towns, again, just brutally beaten them and destroyed them. So he's talking to these kings and he's sort of interrogating them about the men that they've killed up until this point. And he says to them in verse 19, he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. Then he said to Jether, his firstborn, get up and kill them. The youth did not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. Zeba and Zalmunna said, get up and strike us down yourself, for a man is judged by his strength. So Gideon got up, killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. This is that point that I was making earlier about not taking the, the Lord's name in vain. Gideon, in an effort to make himself look justified and to some degree holy, or sanctimonious in the way that he's about to brutally kill these people, throws God's name on the front end of it. He takes an oath and says, surely as the Lord lives, if you hadn't done that, I was going to leave you alone. We can tell by how the story's progressing and as Gideon's revealing what his character is really like, Gideon was going to kill them anyway. Taking the Lord's name in vain is less about the sequence of words and where you insert God's name into it and more to do with, are you invoking the name of a holy God over the top of your agenda to make you feel better about what you're about to do? One of the most common places that we see this, again, I did youth ministry, so I heard this a lot more frequently, 
God told me you're the person I'm supposed to marry. Interesting. He didn't tell me that. And then last bit that I want to hit on and then just kind of land the plane here. As we get into the close of Gideon's narrative and we start to see about the legacy that he's going to leave in verse 22, the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you as well as your sons and your grandsons, for you delivered us from the power of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Then he said to them, let me make a request of you. Everyone give me an earring from his plunder. Now the enemy had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They said, we agree to give them. So they spread out a cloak. Everyone threw an earring from his plunder on it. The weight of the gold earrings he requested was 43 pounds of gold. I did the math. We're talking about $1.2 million worth of gold. The purple garments of the kings of Midian and the chains on the necks of their camels, he got all of that. So Gideon made an ephod from all this and put it in Ophrah's hometown then all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his household. Forwarding through to verse 30, Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, since he had many wives. His concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore a son, and he named him Abimelech. Then Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age, and he was buried in the tomb of his father, Joash, in Ophrah and the Abusrites. Gideon is one of the perfect pictures, unfortunately, that we have of somebody who did not end well. To give you, again, some background and history to what's going on there, uh, in the law, when Moses gave it, he gave very specific instructions around the type of person a king was supposed to be and things he was supposed to do if if they were going to appoint a king. A couple of the things were Number one, you are not going to have very many wives. And number two, all of this stuff that I'm telling you about the type of a king you're supposed to be, you're supposed to read it, put it up in your room so that you can read it every single day. And again, Gideon gives this sort of sanctimonious answer to Israel when, he said, when they say, you know, be our ruler, be our king over us. He says, I'm not going to be a king. But then he immediately turns around and starts collecting $1.2 million worth of taxes. And he goes forward from there and he makes an ephod uh, for, not to get too deep into this, but when you look at the languages of the people from around that same time frame that were neighbors to Israel, uh, an ephod paints this picture of a garment that was put over the top of a deity that you would then worship. So there are ephods that are referenced, again, in the Old Testament. If you have questions about that, I can answer them later. I won't go fully down that rabbit trail now because I need to let you guys go here in a minute. Um, Gideon takes, again, he takes a king's ransom from the battle that he believes he won for himself. After saying, no, I'm not going to be a king over you, he then... creates this deity that Israel worships after just coming from a victory that God made very clear he got for them. They did not get for themselves. He has 70 wives and concubines, which, again, looking at religions from around that same time frame, uh, this is an exact parallel of, if you look at the story of Baal, this is an exact parallel of the amount of wives and concubines that Baal had in their mythology. So Gideon's even setting up his own life to look like and model the gods of the neighboring villages and towns that they weren't supposed to worship. And then to really get an understanding of what's going on in Gideon's heart, just to sort of drive the point home, he names one of his sons Abimelech. To get into the Hebrew of what that means, Avi, my father, Melech, the king. Gideon says, no, I'm not going to be your king. I'm not going to rule over you. One of the 70 sons he he sires, he calls, my father is the king. He's kind of a textbook picture of somebody who does not end well. 
but I want to leave us with this. If you go into Hebrews chapter 11, the, the hall, hall of faith that many of us talk about, after the writer of Hebrews defines what faith is and what it looks like, he goes off and lists all these people with all these conquests. And guess whose name is in there? God in his providence doesn't actually allow Gideon's failure to be the final word about who he is. He lists Gideon in a list of people next to Abraham, next to prophets who were persecuted, and he lists Gideon as somebody who by faith put foreign armies to flight. And I want to leave us with that for a few, few reasons. Number one, regardless of how badly you've messed up, your opinion of yourself and other people's opinion of you, regardless of how strong they are, doesn't get the final word about your story. And then number two, I want this scriptural way of even looking at Gideon's life to be a challenge to us. Because we're in a culture and a world, uh, a church culture, I should say, where church hurt is sort of the main topic of discussion. And typically what we end up doing with leaders who have failed and caused church hurt is we crucify them, put them in a corner, and they're lucky if they get let back into the building to do anything. Church discipline is real and it should exist. But the point of discipline is to bring somebody back into alignment with God so that they can be restored. As we process pain that the church has caused us, as we process pain that other people have caused us, that religious leaders have caused us, process it, realize that their failures, which are very real, are not God's final word about them. And if as you process your pain, there's no space for them to get restored, you're actually not processing the way Jesus would have you process it. I could say a lot more stuff, but I've already gone over, so I'm going to pray for us. Could you guys stand up with me, please? So, Father, we just come to you today and we're thankful for your word that warns us. We're thankful for your word that gives us wisdom, that gives us instruction. Jesus, we're thanking you um, that for the, but for the grace of God, so go I. So, Jesus, I'm asking for us as a body, for you to instill humility in us that as we go through these stories and as, even as we look at Gideon, that we wouldn't look at and say, man, that guy really screwed up. How could he do that? That we would say, God, I know I'm only two steps away from that without your help. Keep me low. Keep me steady with you. Keep me locked into your heart. Jesus, that we would be a body that goes after you, that does your thing, your way, and your timing. Father, I pray a blessing over your people today. I pray a blessing as they go, a blessing on the word that the things that need to stick would stick. God, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name.